All right, good morning, everybody. Um, brief introduction, my name is Guy Alon. Um, in my training, I'm a neuroscientist. Got my PhD studying uh, structure function of AMPA and K-NAID glutamate receptors. Uh, did my postdoc um, focused uh, on biology related more to muscular dystrophy, um, and then was heading to, like many or most of you, to, uh, to academia, for, you know, to, to be a faculty. And then the sort of un, unplanned uh, happened, and I uh, received and, and accepted an offer to join Genentech, and I established my lab there, did basic uh, research uh, on the bench, uh, like probably most of you. Um, and that led to identification of targets uh, around which I build uh, drug discovery programs. So I led several drug discovery programs and teams um, through the various stages of the discovery space, uh, and with some of them matured into INDs and into the clinical space, and with that myself evolved kind of more into clinical development. Um, and since then have been dancing on both the discovery and, and the development floors. Um, moved to Ultragenics Pharmaceutical, which uh, is a rare disease company, and there I led um, clinical stage programs for pediatric neurodevelopmental disorders. And then in 2021, moved to Nomura Therapeutics, where I'm now heading the Portfolio and Program Management Group, which is really the department that is tasked with leading the clinical stage programs. Uh, so I do that, and on top of that, continue to lead um, development teams and programs currently focused on um, depression, anxiety, and schizophrenia. Uh, I've had the privilege of, of being faculty on, on this course for the last five years, and I think that uh, Mike and Barb uh, continue to invite me because I embrace the challenge of every year speaking to a group of honorable and hangry people just before lunch, and so it's convenient. Okay, okay so with that, we'll, we'll get started. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be talking about antibodies uh, as, as therapies for CNS diseases. So antibodies are relatively a young sort of therapeutic modality, if you will, maybe not as young now as, as gene therapy, which you'll hear more about. Uh, but the first therapeutic antibodies, uh, antibody was approved in 1986. Um, and it was a mouse antibody, which means that basically it was, uh, and, yeah, mice were immunized and antibodies were purified from mice and injected as is to patients. And that was for, um, prevention of, of uh, uh, rejection of kidney transplants. Since then, uh, dozens of antibodies have been approved uh, and are on the market. And most of them are really focused on uh, oncology, autoimmune, and inflammatory uh, diseases. And there are hundreds of them currently in clinical development. Um, antibodies have evolved as, as therapeutics. Um, starting from what we call naked antibodies, like that first one in 1986. But um, there's now an entire field that's called antibody engineering, which is really pretty sophisticated, where antibodies can be engineered. Uh, and engineering can be anything from basically transitioning an, an antibody from a, being a mouse antibody to a humanized antibody, where it has elements of human uh, sequences in it to a fully humanized antibody, uh, moving forward to uh, sort of more elaborate engineering of generating bispecific antibodies, where an antibody has is engineered to identify more than one epitope. Um, antibody drunk conjugates, which is kind of a hybrid of an antibody and a small molecule, where the antibody is the, if you want, the, the missile and the small molecule can be the warhead. Um, as well as other forms of engineering. We'll talk maybe a little bit about this later. So general properties um, of antibodies as, as therapeutics. So I think that one of the, the intrinsic properties, two intrinsic properties of antibodies that make them fairly attractive is that they're naturally high affinity. I mean, we make antibodies, right? I mean, each and every one of us is, is, is a factory of antibodies. So just based on their biological activity, they tend to have high affinity and high selectivity to their targets, uh, almost by definition. 
Um, they are highly amenable to custom tailoring. Uh, as mentioned, you can engineer them to be activating antibodies. They can be blocking antibodies. They can intercept targets. So just in terms of what they do, they can do different things, and you can engineer them to do these things. Um, they are generally very well tolerated, and you'll hear more about, about safety uh, later in the course from Adeline. Uh, but antibodies are considered very safe and tolerable, unless the target that we're hitting is, is like, there's target-mediated toxicity, but the drug by itself is safe. And, uh, and I think that part of that has to do with also the, the degree of selectivity, a specificity of the antibody to its target, which reduces the risk of off-target binding and off-target associated side effects. And you just heard from Kanan about PK. So antibodies have excellent uh, uh, PK properties, very long half-life. So if with small molecules, on average, we're talking about half-life of, of hours. Then with antibodies, days is considered poor PK. We're usually talking about weeks. So your average therapeutic antibody will have a half-life of about 20 days. And some of them are that are now in clinical development uh, there are some that uh, are almost double that, clo close to 40 days, and they can be engineered that way, which means that then instead of dosing daily or twice a day, et cetera, you can actually spread out the dosing to be monthly or even uh, less frequent than that. But there are also limitations for drugs as, as therapeutics. First of all, they're, they're way more expensive to manufacture. And there is a correlation between the cost of a drug and, you know, and its availability to, to patients. And, and that is a downside. They are more expensive, which could limit access. Um, they are limited to cell surface and extracellular targets at the moment. We'll talk more about that. But if you are planning to use an antibody to target an intracellular epitope in a neuron, then you need to think again. And probably an antibody is not the way to go. We'll talk about this a little more. Um, and limited routes of administration. Kanan went over routes of administration. So at this point in time, antibodies are injectables. So you can consider them for IV, for sub-Q, for intrathecal, not as a, a, an oral for now. There are companies that are working on this. and the, I hope that it's just a matter of time before they can be accessible. And, and oral administration is one huge um, advantage of small molecules that antibodies currently do not have. So they do have, antibodies do have a lot of advantages, but we see almost no approved antibody therapies for CNS yet, and the answer is why. And I say almost because it is almost. A few years ago when I, when I gave this talk, maybe the first and second time, it, it said no approved drug. So I, so I changed the no to almost, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm evolving with time. Um, and uh, the reason it's almost is because, you know, Mike Rogowski earlier mentioned CGRPs, uh, and there are CGRP antibodies. Uh, one can argue, and we'll not open this up, whether it's actually CNS or peripheral, because it's not, uh, I think, completely understood where, where the, you know, the, 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 the target is, but, uh, but that, still, um, that's one. And the other is um, a potential can of worms we're not going to get into, which is aducanumab for, you know, for Alzheimer's, which was approved. Whether it works or not is a different story. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, okay, so why, why don't we see more antibodies as, as, as therapeutics? And so... Let's start with, with just the fact that, that antibodies for, well, the, the brain has been considered for the longest time kind of an, 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 you know, a privileged or, in, when it comes to antibodies, cursed organ um, from, from, a, from a drug development perspective. And that's because of the blood-brain barrier, which really limits access of compounds from the periphery or molecules from the periphery to, um, to the brain. Um, and antibodies were considered for the longest time off limits for, for CNS. Now, I don't know, so this is, this is an illustration of a generic antibody, okay? Now, I don't know, can you see this? This is not something that a fly left on my screen. Um, 
this is, this is actually a small molecule, okay? So this is roughly to scale, okay? Um, and it just, it just kind of gives you a bit of a visual of, of the difference in size, right? And so this small molecule there is, you know, approximately 400 Daltons, which is kind of the size of a small molecule that you would want for, you know, to, to, for, for it to be brain penetrant or smaller than that. Of course, that's not the only consideration. Other properties are required for the small molecule too, but, but the size here does matter. The antibody is just huge, okay? It's 150 kD uh, molecule, and so uh, how is this gonna cross? When you look at the brain vasculature, it's, this is kind of an illustration of this. Actually, in the adult brain, it's, it's about four, there are about 400 miles combined of, of vasculature, which is, which is substantial. Now, this is an electron micrograph of, of the blood-brain barrier, and you can see here the electron-dense structure. This is the barrier itself. And this is the luminal side of, of the blood vessel. This is the brain parenchyma here on the other side. And in general, the ratio, when, when you, you know, for every thousand antibody molecules that are circulating in the blood, you will find one in the brain. So the one to 1,000 is kind of that, that, that's the ratio that you'll get. Antibodies can get through, but it's, it really is quite inefficient. In general, when you look at this illustration, this is a capillary lumen of a blood vessel. The brain parenchyma is here. Those are the tight junctions, which are really tight when it comes to the brain. And molecules do, I mean, the brain needs its nutrients, and there is a need for flow of molecules on both sides of that barrier. However, this flow happens through what's called um, transcytosis, okay, or receptor-mediated transcytosis, where you have receptors on the luminal side, you have ligands that are floating in the plasma, and they bind, and then you have a deliberate receptor-mediated transition from one side to the other. But there's very little diffusion that really is happening, right? It, it, this is deliberate transport. So how do antibodies end up getting? And what they do is they, they basically hitchhike. So I'll, I'll show you a short sort of cartoon of how this works. This is the lumen of the blood vessels. This is the barrier. Those are receptors for molecules X, Y, and Z, right? And those are the ligands that are floating. And what you'll see in a second is how these ligands bind these receptors, and then you have vesicles that basically pinch off. They bud, and they get translocated to the other side of the barrier. So, and here in purple or pink, what you see is antibodies. And what you'll see is that as, even though the antibodies themselves are not receptor-mediated, you know, Binding, what they do is they just passively hitchhike on this pinching off of vesicles, and then when they bud off on the other side into the brain parenchyma, the antibodies are just getting released there. So it's not really, you know, a planned, it's more of a kind of, it, it, it just happens. It, and that's why it's called passive uptake. So all this is kind of cute on a cartoon. What, what's the evidence that this is actually happening? So. This is just an example. This is uh, from, from a paper where um, authors looked at, uh, at um, the ability to, to get tau antibodies into the brain of a tau transgenic model. And this is the model. Those are sections uh, of deposition of, of tau aggregates in the brain of these mice, and you can see in two months almost nothing, four, six. So with time, with age, you have more and more accumulation of pathology in these brains. And here, you know, tau antibodies were administered. I'm not gonna get into the details, but you can see different dose levels, three, 10, 30 mg per kg. This is another antibody at three and 30 mg per kg. This is in plasma. So basically, those mice are dosed intraperitoneally, and antibody concentrations are, me are uh, measured in plasma. And you can see a dose, you know, a dose-dependent um, uh, exposure in plasma. And then brains were harvested, and antibody concentrations, drug concentrations, were measured in the brain. And what you can see is that those two are 
kind of mirror imaging each other, right? So you can see that there is drug in brain, and even though the, so the numbers are small, I don't know if you can see it, but if you look carefully at the y-axis of this graph and this graph, you'll see that the concentration here is 1 to 1,000 in ratio, okay? So you dose IP, you see it in plasma, you see it in brain with 1 to 1,000 ratio, but it does get into the brain. Now, when the concentrations of insoluble tau are measured in treated brains, what you can see is that there is, if this is the placebo dose, then those are the, you know, the, the drug dose. And so the, you, one can measure the reduction of accumulation of insoluble tau pathology in the brains of these mice, and here you can just see an illustration of untreated and a treated mouse. And so in this experiment, you can just appreciate that in a peripherally administered drug can get into the brain and can have a downstream effect, okay? All righty, so we're gonna go through some examples of antibodies as blocking agents, as neutralizing or intercepting agents, and as, as activating um, agents. The one thing that I do want to emphasize is the point that when you think about the compartment of target engagement for antibodies in the brain, the compartment of target engagement is the ISF, which is the interstitial fluid which really is the immediate extracellular environment that is surrounding brain cells in the parenchyma where the neurons or other cells. Um, this, is, uh, this means that antibodies will bind either soluble proteins or targets in the ISF, or they will bind extracellular domains of transmembrane proteins are expressed in cells, but they will bind their extracellular domain, not the intracellular domain, okay? So again, this feeds into what I said earlier, which is you need to consider your target and whether it's appropriate for an antibody. And at this point in time, what's appropriate for an antibody is either a soluble extracellular target or a membrane-bound target, but that the epitope that you're going after is exposed to the extracellular environment because that is the environment that antibodies that you administer will float in. They will not just passively get into cells. Okay. Okay, so let's consider, I mean, antibodies are really, when you think about it, they're adapters, okay? Y shape, you know, they have their fab, the arms, they bind the target, and then with the leg, the FC, they will bind to what we call an effector cell, whether it's a macrophage or a microglia or whatever it is. Now, antibodies by themselves, I mean, when they're circulating and they're unbound to anything, they don't just get internalized. They continue to circulate. After an antibody binds its target in the extracellular environment, then certain changes happen in the antibody, including conformational changes, which make it recognizable to FC receptors, which are the receptors that are expressed on the effector cell. And that triggers you know, an internalization of the complex, of the antibody target complex, which then gets degraded intracellularly, okay? So the ability to identify the effector cell, the binding between the FC portion and the effector cell is what we call an effector function. Now, for you, you will find in the literature some papers that are suggesting that antibodies target intraneuronal epitopes. They do exist in the literature. The, th those are based on they're based on doing immunohistochemistry or mainly immunofluorescence. Um, where an antibody was basically applied on a section, tissue section, and then a secondary antibody was applied. Whoever does immunofluorescence knows this. It's your bread and butter. And then you see a signal. The problem is that this is highly amenable to just to false positives if your antibody, your primary antibody, is dirty. So the, you know, I think that what I want to illustrate here is, 
that there, there is a claim that FC gamma receptors, which are the receptors that bind an antibody and internalize it, expressed, are expressed in neurons. This is not the case. So if you look at the expression profile, of FC gamma receptors 1, 2B, and 3 in different cells that were sorted from brains of neonatal mice, then you can see that they're expressed in microglia. You have a little bit on, in oligodendrocyte precursor cells, precursor cells, nothing in neurons. They do not express FC gamma receptors. Now, this is a neonatal mice. If you look at adult mice, same thing. If you look at adult mice that are mouse models for Alzheimer's disease, same thing, right? They do not express FC gamma receptors. Now, if you do your immunofluorescence carefully, then you also see that you can detect FC gamma receptors in microglia, but not in neurons. And you can look at these references for, for more information. But I'm stressing this point because it is, it, because it's critical, because y you want, your drug to meet your target. So be sure that, that it actually is happening. And when it comes to antibodies, the intra versus extracellular is key. And if any of you will be the ones that will figure out how to engineer an antibody to target an intracellular target, I think that the, you know, a, a thing that that'll be a, an incredible contribution to the field. I'm not joking. But it doesn't exist at this point in time. Okay, so just be very careful with how you plan your target and the therapeutic modality for this target, as well as when you read papers, read them critically. The one thing that I cannot show you, I'll share with you verbally, but I cannot share with you from a data perspective yet, is that these experiments of, con of, of showing that FC gamma receptors are not expressed in neurons uh, has been done in humans and not just uh, healthy humans, based on post-mortem brains that, that basically went on, underwent cell sorting, but also Alzheimer's brains and other neurodegenerative diseases. So even kind of an abnormal process of abnormal expression of FC gamma receptors has not been demonstrated. Okay. Okay. Some examples. So this is example, an example for, for a blocking antibody. How do you use an antibody to block? And here the target is base one. Base one is an enzyme that's part of the APP processing cascade that re results with the production of A-beta. So the context here is Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is a crystal st structure. You can see here the region in, in the base one enzyme that is basically the pocket of that, that's the active site. So base one um, small molecules have been, many of them have been generated and, and tested in the clinic. They all bind this pocket and this pocket is very, very similar in its structure to, uh, to similar pockets in base two and cathepsin D and other, other enzymes. And so there's just a problem of of off-target, potential off-target toxicity, which the small molecules have been grappling with for a long time. And what was done here with an antibody is, an antibody was, was found that could bind to an exocyte, basically a, a, a site outside of the binding pocket, which is selective to base one, specific to base one, and doesn't exist in the other enzymes. And so that allowed for a high degree of selectivity with and bypassing the potential issue of off-target binding to similar targets. And this, this was done in animals, and you can see here the large molecule versus a small molecule in terms of its ability to inhibit base one activity, both inhibit base one activity, and when the antibody is administered in vivo, then it reduces A-beta concentrations in plasma and at high doses also in the brain. This ended up not moving into clinical development, but from a proof of concept perspective, preclinically, this was shown to you know to be to be possible. Um, interestingly enough, we talked about effector function, right? The ability to be recognized by uh, by effector cells like macrophages, microglia, with this particular antibody. Um, it was seen that if the antibody had effector function. In other words, it could bind microglia. This resulted with severe adverse events. And if, if the ability to bind FC gamma receptors was engineered out of the antibody, then it was completely safe. 
yet it's still effective. In other words, antibody effector function, depending on your target and your proposed mechanism of action, may not be required. Okay, another example. So this is sort of neutralizing or intercepting prion-like uh, mechanisms. So here, this is an example for tau, uh, starting with a sort of a cartoon. So this is where misfolded proteins start accumulating in the cytosol of neurons, and those are toxic, and cells do different things in order to try and cope with this. And one of the things that they do is they spit it out. Um, because it's not a bad way of reducing the effective sort of concentration inside the cell of, of the insult. The problem is that then they, you know, they do their thing in, in, in everybody else's pool, right? And then, and then these misfolded proteins that are now in the extracellular environment can be taken up by other proteins, uh, sorry, by other neurons, and then you start having this cell-to-cell -cell spread and propagation. Um, of misfolded proteins that start templating misfolding in other in other cells, and this is this kind of underlies that hypothesis of cell to cell propagation of misfolded proteins that is implicated in multiple neurodegenerative conditions, including Alzheimer's, uh, uh, Parkinson's, ALS with TDP forty three, etc. Um, so, what's what was the idea behind antibodies for this? Uh, the idea is that once um, misfolded proteins are released, that antibodies can basically intercept, engulf these, these ag you know, aggregates or, or misfolded proteins and prevent the internalization by other neurons, basically to promote the clearance of those. And at least for Alzheimer's disease, you know, when you look at Brock staging, then there is a correlation between the spread, spatiotemporal spread of pathological tau aggregates and symptomatology and cognitive decline. And so the idea was that if one can slow that cell-to-cell -cell progression, then maybe one can slow down also cognitive decline. Okay, so let's kind of zoom in on this a little bit. I wanna show you an example here. So in, in, this, in this experiment, I'll show you some basically data that was generated in, in, in cultured neurons. Um, the idea is that you have one neuron, upstream neuron, that's, you know, sick. And this neuron releases misfolded proteins that then are taken up by the downstream neuron, thereby generating the cell-to-cell -cell propagation. Now, this, this splits into two, kind of two parts. The first part is, treat, what happens when you treat with a full effector function tau antibody? This means that this antibody can bind the tau aggregates and intercept them and prevent the spread from neuron one to neuron two. So neuron two is happy, okay? But this is a full effector function antibody, which means that once you have the antibody target complex, this complex can be recognized by microglia and taken up and degraded, right? So it's cleared, happy days, okay? So that's, that's, our, that's story number one. Full effector function antibody. Now, story number two is almost identical with one difference. And that is, it's the same antibody, only this antibody was new, basically the, the ability of this antibody to bind FC gamma receptor on microglia was deleted. So it binds the tau equally well, but it cannot be recognized by a microglial cell. So this complex does not yet taken up. Okay, so those are our two stories. Now let's see what happens. So what you have here are cultured neurons that are stained with MAP2 so that you can see the morphology of, of their dendrites, okay? And this is, a, this, is a happy, this is a happy culture, okay? You can see intact dendrites here and all is good. Now when you take sort of recombinant oligomeric phosphotau, which is toxic to neurons, you can see the fragmentation that happens here. They basically start falling apart. This usually happens within 24 to 72 hours. Now, if you add to this culture a full effector function antibody, a tau antibody, or and what we call, let's call it here, effectorless. So it's same antibody in terms of its ability to bind tau. One can bind microglia, the other can't bind microglia. Both can basically preserve the intactness of these neurons. So they can prevent the, the fragmentation. 
If you take just a control placebo antibody, it doesn't protect, okay? Now, here, I don't know if you can see it. I hope it's clear enough. But this here, there's staining for, for actually in green is, is the tau aggregates themselves. And if you, hopefully you can see, in both it, here, you can find the tau aggregates inside neurons. In the treated with either one of these antibodies, actually there's no tau in these neurons. So you, you basically added an antibody. And what this antibody did was bind tau in the extracellular environment and prevented the uptake. And by that, basically rescued these neurons from fragmentation, okay? Those are just neurons, okay? Now, if you do the same experiment, this graph, by the way, is just a quantification of the fragmentation. So you can basically see that, you know, unfragmented toxic tau causes fragmentation. Both antibodies rescue the, you know, from fragmentation. Now, you do something very similar, only with one difference. You do it plus and minus microglia. So this is top row, just, just neurons. And here, it's exactly what you saw up here. Tau causes fragmentation. Antibody with effector function rescues. Antibody that is effectorless rescues. However, bottom row is a co-culture, where you have neurons and microglia together. Toxic tau causes fragmentation. A full effector function antibody does not rescue the fragmentation. The effector effectorless antibody does. So what does that tell you in this particular example? What it tells you is that effector function can matter. It doesn't have to, but it can. It's a consideration. Sometimes you want to engage microglia because that may be part of the mechanism of action that you, are, that you want to engage, and then you want that. But you have to consider that you may not have to have it in order to have a, a positive effect, and it could backfire. Okay, It doesn't have to, but it could. So it's a consideration. It's something to keep in mind. Okay, let's look at some, some, uh, some examples for activation. And the first one is, is aducanumab. Okay, so this is an anti-amyloid antibody. And the MOA for aducanumab is to clear plaque. Now, for that, by definition, you need to engage microglia. So here you need full effector function. Okay? By definition. So that, all I'm saying, I'm not being judgmental of whether you, you should or shouldn't. All I'm saying is be aware that effector function is an, a modality that you can play with and you can fine tune. And you need to figure out for your target, for your proposed mechanism of action, for your project, do you need it or not? Know that you have the optionality there, okay? So aducanumab has been shown to be effective in clearing, micro, you know, clearing plaque. It engages microglia, and it clears plaque. Now, whether or not and how that may translate into a clinically meaningful benefit for patients is a different story. We're not going to get into that here. But from an MOA perspective, it was designed to clear, clear plaque by being a full effector antibody, and it does it. Okay? Now, of note is that it does come at a, you know, at, with... with side effects, right? This engagement induces aria, aria-e, which is basically what's kind of what you see in, in publications as, as the brain swelling and bleeding, et cetera. Um, and this is, this is mediated by the IgG1 full effector nature of this antibody. So do you think it's a good fact that the uh, location of the mechanism of action, do you think it's a, it's a brain panic map or the, in the blood vessel? I think that's an open question. That may, and, and it, maybe it's both. It could be both. 
So that's that is a, so you're talking not specifically about aducanumab, but just in general. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you're asking, are the small amounts that are predicted to be in brain going to be sufficient in order for this to be efficacious, no matter what the indication is? It's more of a general question, right? Is that what you're asking? So, I mean, I can't speak for aducanumab specifically, but what, I mean, I think that when you look at, at the scans, when you look at PET scanning, it is very clear that the antibody is effective in clearing plaque. And I think that that plaque clearance, I'm not a radiologist, but when I look at these scans, my interpretation of the scans is that it does it pretty effectively not not, and not in a way that's restricted to vasculature. I think that it clears plaque from brain parenchyma. Now, whether or not that translates to a benefit for patients is a different story, right? But from, but from an MOA perspective, I think that it clears plaque from brain parenchyma. I mean, that's, that's what the data suggests. So uh, to your question, can you get enough to have a, to, to hit your MO, you know, to, to hit your target and to trigger the, the sort of the downstream pharmacodynamic effect that you want, I think that the data suggests that probably yes. Um, but I think that, and we'll get to that. I have a, maybe two or three slides from now. I have you know, a, a certain checklist, if you will, that addresses the, the, the factors that feed into kind of how much drug you're going to need, how much antibody you're going to need. So idea is the one, one idea is that Avera is cleared by through the blood vessel, you know, for the Avera to cross BBB. And the idea is one of the major clearance Avera is through the blood flow. So might be that is in this case is not kind of by the clearance by not inside the brain parenchyma, just for the clear kind of the those antibody and medicine kind of facilitate for the clearance Avera. I, I would uh, let's let's take this offline later, but I, I see it a bit differently. Aducanumab is not the only um, amyloid antibody that was tested in the clinic. Others have been tested as well, and some of them are, have been for for example, solanuzumab and cronizumab uh, are, are, were geared toward targeting uh, monomeric and oligomeric A-beta, and th they're not clearing plaque. Uh, and so kind of that sync hypothesis of by, by sucking out monomeric uh, A-beta, that is what driving the clearance, which is, it used to be called the peripheral sync hypothesis as well. I think that that has been debunked, but we can talk about this a little more a bit later. Okay. Um, briefly, uh, here's another example, and that's actually a periphery example. So we're, we're kind of focused on CNS, but this is neuro, a course for neurotherapeutics. And let's remember that there are, you know, there are some neurons in the periphery as well, one or two, and they may need our help once in a while as well uh, for certain conditions. So, so let's, let's not forget the periphery. So this is just an example um, of, um, of an activating antibody. Um, and this is, the context here is, is ALS. Um, and the target here is, uh, is a, a kinase that's called MUSC, which stands for muscle-specific kinase. And this kinase is expressed on, um, on the muscle side of the neuromuscular junction and is important in establishing and maintaining neuromuscular junctions, which really is just to... to, to facilitate and maintain the relationship between the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic muscle fiber. And um, what happens in ALS is at some point as motor neurons die uh, or are sick and about to die, that they start kind of retracting. In other words, when you have this neuromuscular junction sort of uh, connection, that at some point the motor neuron that kind of feeds into the muscle fiber just retracts. And the idea was here, kind of the therapeutic hypothesis was that, that by activating musk, one could maybe keep that junction 
there for a little longer, and hopefully that would translate also to slowing down the process of motor neuron uh, degeneration and death, et cetera, and symptoms. So um, here what you see is just a, a conv this is staining of a neuromuscular junction, and this is the axonal terminal, this is the acetylcholine receptors, so this is from the muscular side. And here, this musk antibody was administered, and you can see that it localizes nicely. So you, you administer intraperitoneally, and it gets to the neuromuscular junction, and it kind of localizes there. Um, so those are, those are images from, you know, representative images, and what you have here at the you know, here is a wild type, uh, wild type mouse, and this is a SOD1 transgenic mouse model for, for ALS. And in a wild type mice, you can see how, that you have a lot of yellow, and yellow means basically a good overlap of presence of the pre and post synaptic membranes. In other words, the, the, you know, the neuron is there and, and the muscle is there and they live happily ever after. And, and what you see here is with the SOD1 transgenic mouse, you can see the, the postsynaptic uh, muscular side of the junction. You don't see the yellow and red anymore, which means that here the, the motor neurons just retracted. They're no longer there. Now, if you dose with this antibody, then you can see that in, you actually can see a pretty impressive preservation of neuromuscular junctions in, um, in the SOD1 mice. Um, so this suggests that, you know, you dose the antibody, it gets to the site of action, and it actually does what you want it to do. It does preserve these neuromuscular junctions, which is, which I think is, is quite cool. Um, unfortunately, and that's just, a, that's just how things panned out here, this did not translate when you do sections through the, you know, through the spinal cord of these, these mice. It did not translate to preservation of longer term of, of these cell bodies of the motor neurons. And when they looked at physiology, then it also did not preserve function or prolong life, et cetera. So all in all, this did not move forward. However, I think that it's still a, an interesting example of, of hitting a target in the periphery and actually seeing the downstream sort of expected biology, which suggests that you can engineer an antibody to activate an enzyme. So again, this is more than anything, just I, I'm trying to give you examples of the versatility of, of antibodies in terms of what you might be able to do with them if it's relevant for your, you know, for your current or future projects. Um, just in a couple of words, we talked about the fact that not a lot of antibody does get into the brain. So for years now, there have been a lot of efforts still ongoing to enhance brain ac uh, uh, exposure of antibodies, and one of the ways that to do that or to try to do that is to piggyback on receptor-mediated transcytosis and actually try and harness it, where one could conceive of engineering an antibody such that it actually not passively but actively binds a receptor on this side, and then it can you know then the uptake can be a little more efficient. So. Um, one of the, the prime examples in the field is piggybacking on the transferrin receptor, which basically, that's what it does. It transfers transferrin from the plasma to the brain. Um, and those are just examples. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but this is one example of, I mentioned the base one antibody earlier when we talked about blocking antibodies. Uh, so here, a bispecific antibody was generated where one arm but is still binding your target, which is base one, and another arm is engineered to bind the transferrin receptor. And when you do that, then you can, you know, instead of having sporadic here and there an antibody move through, you have more antibodies that make it across. And just to show you some data, so this is plasma PK. Actually, interestingly enough, the bispecific antibody PK in the periphery is, is pretty bad. It's actually worse than your, your um, so you can see here, for example, you see in, in yellow is your regular conventional anti-base antibody, and in blue you have an anti, you have a bispecific antibody, and you can see that it gets cleared much faster in the plasma. However, when you look at the brain PK, look at the brain PK, then you can see that the blue one, which cleared faster here, is, is actually, you know, it has more brain exposure. So the brain PK is better than the plasma PK here. 
uh, compared to your green, which is your generic uh, antibody. And then when you look at the PD readout, which here is basically measuring the levels of, of A-beta peptide in the brains, and the idea is to try and lower the levels of A-beta peptide, you can see that the blue one, the bispecific, does it better than you know, than, than the generic one. Again, just as an example, there's still more to go there. And there are some, there, there are complexities with bispecifics. First of all, um, they're more, I mean, they are more complicated to manufacture um, and expensive. Uh, from a safety perspective, if you do that, you need to consider that you're now targeting also some receptor in the blood-brain barrier. So are there gonna be any safety considerations regarding that and is this receptor expressed peripherally as well? If yes, then you need to factor that into your safety considerations as well. Um, and valency and avidity. What we're doing here is we're gaining uptake, but we're losing one binding arm, right? So when you do the stoichiometry, that also feeds in. So it's a little more complicated than that, right? But all these are considerations that you need to be aware of. A few words on safety. Uh, again, as mentioned, in general, very safe and tolerable, and, and that depends on the target and MOA. So usually if something bad will happen, it'll be because of, of you know, the target and the MOA itself and how you, you engineer the antibody. Um, there, it's not uncommon to have anti-therapeutic antibodies called ATAs or ADAs. In other words, this is where your, your you know, when, when an antibody is administered as a therapeutic, that your own body mounts an immune response against the antibody. Those are usually benign. Rarely does it cause any, any issue. It usually is not an issue at all. Um, but just be aware. Um, drug developers develop assays to measure that so that they factor that into kind of the overall characterization of the antibody. Not something that you will need to do, but just be aware. It can happen. It's usually... It, it's usually not an issue. Um, high target selectivity, as mentioned, reduces the risk for off-target binding and activity. Um, and the one thing that we touched on, you do want to just make sure when you, when you target something that you understand the expression profile of this target um, in general. It's not enough that it's in the brain, but if it's expressed in other tissues, you want to you want to know that that could that could feed into kind of your safety considerations. And we talked about effector function, uh, target engagement in in the brain, and that feeds to your earlier question. Just a few considerations. That this is where you are going to be working with with you know your your clinical pharmacologist or PK scientist to help you with that. Uh, but what determines um, the, the target engagement uh, in, in the brain and how much do you need uh, to dose. So the factors that feed into that and goes into kind of a model of an, an, an equation uh, is the antibody half-life. That matters a lot. Sometimes it matters more than even the affinity of the antibody. Uh, so what is the half-life on the... Because the more it lingers around, the more time it has to engage target. If it's fast clearing, then it doesn't have much time, then you need higher affinity, okay? So antibody half-life, the antibody concentration in ISF, um, the affinity of the antibody, and the concentration of the target, right? So when you, when you do your biology, knowing what is the concentration of target in the compartment of target engagement is helpful. The more you know, the more accurate you can, you can uh, predict doses and the target half-life. So how much drug do you need in order to engage a target is something that together with a clinical pharmacologist or a PK scientist, they'll be able to help you out. What they won't be able to help you out with is how much target engagement you need to actually have clinical efficacy. I think that the only way to do that is called phase two clinical trial in, in patients. So you'll have to be patient with that. Okay, um, to summarize, highly versatile, you know, have a lot of advantages. Uh, BBB is, is permeability is limiting, but, but if, if you dose high enough and you're, you know, and antibodies are usually safe, then you, you know, it's definitely uh, something that can be overcome. You have, you know, the flexibility to pick your, you know, your epitope to determine your F, your, your MOA, yes, no effective function, you want to activate, you want to inhibit, whatever you want to do. Fantastic PK pro 
properties and generally safe. Be aware of the limitations, limited routes of administration. It is expensive and at this point in time limited to extracellular targets or epitopes. And with that, if there are any questions, if I haven't exhausted you for yep. Yes, uh, I, I have a quick question. So for example, you talk about there's um, not a fully effective antibody. They, they bind to that uh, the tau has been spit out by the cell. So if they, they just bind them, do they just sit in the extracellular space because it's... Uh, it's a, uh, yeah, that's a good question. And uh, the, the answer is that the evidence suggests that it, it ends up clear because ultimately you have a, there is a connection between ISF and CSF because you have, I mean, those, those fluids circulate and what we see is that after a while you start seeing these complexes basically in the periphery. Mm. So eventually it, it probably just drains out. Okay. Then let's see if I have like a target. I want to do this antibody drug screening, right? Like we, we don't know what's the step. Like a, can you briefly talk about if I have a target or whatever protein it's on the cell surface, I want to initiate a, a antibody pro program to target that, that, that target. So what, what's the step we should do? Thank you. So I think that it starts with, um, first of all, just knowing the you know, knowing which, what are the extracellular epitopes. So just being familiar with, if it's an extracellular, if it's a transmembrane protein, mm. then just the initial characterization of what's intracellular, what's extracellular, right? It sounds trivial, but knowing that is kind of important. And then how do you go about it? Well, if you have in your lab or your university, there's a facility that can do immunization that engage with them. Otherwise, there are plenty of CROs that will do that okay. and work with you. And basically what will happen is that they will generate peptides of those epitopes and immunize whatever species that may be. It can be mice, it can be rats, it can be a whole like goats, it can be, there's a whole, yeah. Um, and you'll, and you'll, whoever you work with, if it's not your every, I, my personal recommendation would be, unless you have an antibody engineering facility in your institution, is to connect with a CRO, basically a vendor. There are multiple of them that, and then they are, then you don't need to deal with it because it becomes a one-stop shop and they will help you set up the assays and then what you're gonna get is, you're gonna get from them bleeds, Sarah, basically. And you'll be able, whether it's ELISA's or Western's or whatever it is, they'll help you set up assays. Um, and you'll basically start screening. And it'll go through a screening cascade with a funnel that ultimately will have, now depending on the antibody, you, you know, it usually starts with seeing reactivity to something. It starts with characterization of affinity. But as you think about setting up your screening cascade, you need to go back to, what are you trying to do with this antibody? Because if you want the antibody to block, then you actually need a certain assay that will tell you that your antibody is, binding is not enough. You need binding and blocking. Activating is not enough. You need blocking. So, so the, you need the appropriate assay. Sometimes there's a tendency to just say, I just want the highest affinity antibody and that's what I'm gonna take into animals. But wait a minute, if you want it to have a function, you need to be able to test the function. Okay, so you, you kind of need to line these things up as, as you plan. Yeah, uh, uh, could you uh, comment a little bit more on the uh, application of uh, like the smaller size of antibody, like a nano, nanobody? Right? Yeah, so good, good question. I, I would say this. So I've been asked about, you know, nanobodies, uh, intrabodies, um, single chains, et cetera. So this is where it gets a little tricky. So first of all, from a size perspective, they're still too big. Now, if, if, you, if you generate nanobodies as, as recombinant proteins and you administer them, they get cleared very fast because they don't have the, they don't have the FC portion, which is required for, going back to slide three, the FC, FC portion of the antibody 
has the recognition site for the neonatal FCRN, which is part of the mechanism that allows for such a long half-life for antibodies. Now, if you use only the FABs, which many times nanobodies are just the FAB, then it gets cleared super fast. So if you administer it peripherally, it doesn't linger long enough to even get into the brain. So it's still too big, and it clears too quickly. And now, if, now, there are some efforts for, with nanobodies that are more gene therapy. In other words, you, you say, I'm going to encode a nanobody in an AAV, and I'm going to administer. But then it's, it's, not, it's no longer antibody therapy. Then it's already gene therapy. Right? So that's a, whole other, that's a whole other chapter. Go ahead. So can we use like a lipo-15 to increase the penetration of the antibody, like trap them in a lipo-15 system or... Again, I'm sorry, talk, I, I, I'm, I couldn't... I'm talking understand. about how, how, what we can do to increase the, the crossing of antibodies to the BBB, yeah. like using lipo-15 or... Um, I'm not sure if this is something you are thinking about, like using li li lipo-15 or what they call uh, for... Uh, Trapping the whole entity. Yeah, I, I would you know say that. I mean. Yeah, these have been uh, different ways have been and are still being tested. Um, all I can say is that we haven't. Uh, nobody has hit the jackpot yet. Okay, uh, that's uh, that's kind of the bottom line. But but the the uh, efforts around it are getting more and more sophisticated, and so I'm I'm actually optimistic that it's going to happen in the coming years. Um, it's a matter of time, but but yeah, not yet. <laughs> uh, yes, I have just a question about the, I will talk about the protein aggregates. Recently we have seen the couple of uh, confirmation specific antibodies. What do you think, how easy is to develop those antibodies? Um, so it's not easy. Okay, I'll I'll stop there. Uh, no, As a, so when you when you look at these, I mean there there are different examples of them. Okay, I mean I can I can I have several that I can kind of bring up right away. Those usually were a result of uh, purification of a you know of pathological clump from a you know from a human brain. Um, and basically just injecting that into an animal, and then you, then you can get conformational antibodies. Um, whether this is the right way to go from a, from a, a, you know, from a strategic perspective, it has pros and cons. Um, there are examples. I mean, one of them is like Peter Davies from NYU years back generated an, an antibody against tau. It's called MC1, which later was taken by Lilly and, and developed. I think that this has been discontinued. Um, it can be done. I guess that's what I'm going to If you ask me technically, can it be done? Yes. Is it simple? No. Is it advantageous to do from a therapeutic strategy perspective, that's a whole discussion that maybe we can have over lunch or dinner because it has pros and cons. Okay, thank um, you. It's complicated. All right. Um, we are, I uh, think people are getting hungry, so I'm going to stop <laughs> the questions at this point, but, um, and thank uh, Guy for a wonderful presentation. Yeah.